church this month, we have been talking all about healthy relationships. Bear with me, I'll let you sit down in just a second, but uh, I just want to do a quick uh, synopsis, rundown, and then I'll let you guys take your seat. But Pastor Tina kicked off the series by explaining the heart and the intent behind the sermon series, and she explained it using uh, interaction that Jesus had with somebody where he summed up all the commandments under just two simple commandments, right? And you can go to Mark 12, uh, 30 through 31, and I'll run through it super quick. It says, he said, first, right, love the Lord your God with all your soul, all your heart, and all your strength, right? And that's the number one commandment. And then he extends it and he says, and secondly, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And it's that second portion of scripture that has been the fuel for the last couple of sermons, and it's where I want to pick up today. I invite you guys to bow your heads and close your eyes as we go into a moment of prayer. God, as we treat today's subject, God, as we continue to work towards effective, godly relationships with people around us, God, I just ask that you open our hearts, God, that you make us aware, God, of any stones, God, any tripping hazards, God, anything that's stumbling us, God, anything that's impeding us, God, from accomplishing our purpose, accomplishing our intent, God, what we were called to do. And so I just ask, God, that you protect us, that you open our eyes, God, our spiritual ears, God, our eyes to observe you to continue to declare you worthy, God, as we hear this word. And I say this in Jesus' name, amen. You guys may be seated. Church, if you haven't been here for the other sermons, I'll try to catch you up the best I can. There's been an idea that's been developing across the different messages, kind of floating around, um, that I think God is trying to deliver to us as a congregation. Um, and I hope that it's slowly becoming evident to you as we continue through the series. Uh, and so I'll do a quick run through of two statements that I think that summarize the series really well thus far. So number one, with regards to how these commands relate to one another, the ones we talked about earlier, the verse clearly says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so the limiting factor here is how much do you love yourself, right? In church, there's a lot of us who are really good at following this command not because we're good at loving others, but because we're really bad at loving ourselves, right? And so we love other people badly as well. And last week, Pastora talked about unforgiveness, right? And she gave us that stark reminder that hurt people hurt people. So if you carry unforgiveness in your heart, if unforgiveness is something that bogs you down, it's quickly gonna become evident, not only in yourself, but how you treat others. And this is point number one, right? You can only love others as much as you love yourself. And it's tied intimately to point number two, loving yourself means loving God. And as we go through today's message and the rest of these sermon series, I want us to remember that your love for others is limited by how much love you have in you, right? And that's always going to be tied intimately to how in love you are with the creator of love who is God. Right, so we, those are the two things that I want to bury into your heart, right? You can only love others as much as you love yourself and you can only love yourself as much as you love God. And today I want to talk about a particularly deplorable condition, right? We talked about unforgiveness last week. I want to talk about a condition that's very similar. Um, many regard this as the chief of all sins, right? They regard it as the origin point of sin itself. C.S. Lewis, a famous Christian author, author, referred to this state of being as the anti-God state, right? And I'm talking about pride, right? He stated, Pride is what made the devil the devil, right? It's when our ego and our self are in direct opposition to the person of God. And Jonathan Edwards, uh, a very favorite preacher of mine, had this to say about pride. Remember that pride is the worst viper that is in the heart, the greatest, the greatest disturber of the soul's peace and sweet communion with Christ. It was the first ever sin that ever was and lies at the lowest in the foundation of Satan's whole building, and it is the most difficultly rooted out and the most hidden, secret and deceitful of all lust, and often creeps in insensibly in the midst of religion and sometimes under the disguise of humility. What a, what a way to describe such a powerful sin, right? And I find that that last statement is particularly damning, right? It states, often creeps in insensibly is particularly appropriate because if you look up the definition of pride today, Merriam-Webster defines pride as a reasonable self-esteem, confidence, and satisfaction in oneself. And it begins it wrong by saying reasonable, 
right? And if you ask me, there's only one portion of that definition that is any good at all, and that's the later half, confidence and satisfaction in oneself. And I find myself in good company because if you go to the original Webster dictionary written by Noah Webster, he defines it completely different altogether. He defines it as an inordinate self-esteem and unreasonable conceit of one's superiority in talents, beauty, wealth, accomplishment, rank, or elevation in office, which manifests itself in lofty airs, distance, reserve, and often in contempt of others. So as you begin to look at these two definitions and see how they contrast themselves completely, I hope it becomes evident to you the hidden nature of pride. I hope it's starting to become evident to you that pride will never denounce itself as evil or outright wrong. No sin ever will. But pride does something that other sins don't, and it, that it actually declares itself as good, right? Pride declares itself as tying to your self-worth, as being a good thing. And so in light of all of this, I find it appropriate that before we proceed further in today's sermon, we come up with a working good definition, biblically founded, of what pride actually means. And to do that, we're going to go through a couple scriptures. Um, and the first scripture I want us to turn to is Proverbs 16, 5. And it says, The Lord detests all the proud. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. If there was any doubt in your heart from the first two definitions that pride was bad, let this first reassure you let it temper your heart that pride in any situation is wrong, right? And there's few scriptures, few instances in which you will find yourself in direct opposition of the Lord. Few things are ever described as being detested by the Lord. In fact, few other words have strong language, such strong language around it as the word pride does in the Bible. Another version of this says, everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. And so if God is speaking so negatively about having a proud heart, about being proud, that should be an indication to you about how you should feel about pride. And there should be no doubt in your mind that it is a negative feeling and emotion and most definitively a sin. But then what exactly is pride? And so to define the later portion of it, I want us to turn to James 1.17, which reads, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Right? How many of us can say amen to that concept? Every good and perfect gift is from above, right? We just got finishing declaring, God, how worthy our Father and our God is. So anything good about us, anything worth esteeming within us, any portion of us that would be counted as positive, anything about us that would be regarded as good, it's important to recognize that that comes from God. Anything good in us as people comes from God. And so from this verse, we draw our working definition of pride, which is pride is the desire and attempt to assign oneself value and worth independent of God. And that's a, that the closing portion, the portion that's super important is that independent of God. Pride is trying to assign yourself some kind of glory or credibility outside of who God is. And now there's obvious things of pride, right, that can strike an individual. When we think of pride, we often have an image in our head of what that looks like, right? You might say, I, I could pride myself on the ability to break down scripture or speak in public. The worship team who was here up a few moments ago could easily fall into the pit trap of trying to share in God's glory as they worship from an altar, right? As you begin to work on your talents and your gifts and you start to read scripture more, or you practice singing, you spent countless hours practicing an instrument, right? The lines between what was given to you and what you quote unquote earned could begin to blur. And you could begin to pride yourself quite heavily, right? In how well you worship, how well you play an instrument, how well you speak, how well you preach, how well you teach. But that's not the subject matter for the, today's message because I think those are more obvious manifestations of pride. Most people can see that. Most people can call it out. Most people can catch themselves trying to share in God's glory in those situations. 
this definition is good because it can also be used to root out those bits of pride that Jonathan Edward described as elusive, hidden, in the midst of religion and often hidden in humility. It's these types of prides that I want to focus on today. You see there's gifts which which we are born that are obvious manifestations of God's glory that it's hard to credit to anybody but God. A good voice, a sharp mind are perfect examples of this, right? It's hard to say, hey, he earned that voice or hey, you know, he, was, he earned smartness, right? A lot of people, it's easy to attribute that to God because you're born sometimes that way. These are perfect examples of this kind of manifestation or gift. And while all forms of pride are bad and offensive to God, like I said earlier, these prides are easy to recognize. When somebody thinks that they have a great voice, it's easy to recognize that they're being prideful. When somebody thinks they're the smartest person in the room, it's easy to recognize that they're being prideful. But there's other types of gifts that are just as special and just as important to God's work that are in us that are not as obvious, that don't get presented publicly, right? That aren't mentioned as often, that are the real playground for pride. Things such as the ability to forgive, right? The ability to be humble, the ability to be patient, kind, to practice self-control, you might recognize these as some of the fruits of the Spirit. It's in our daily life and our daily use of these gifts that pride likes to invade. It's in our day-to-day -day interactions that pride is the most dangerous, that it goes most unchecked, it does the most damage, and it goes the most unnoticed. It's in the arguing of a husband and a wife, the bickering of friends and siblings. It's in the fights behind closed doors where pride does most of its damage. Right, and this brings us to our first point. Pride kills your individual perception of what value is. What do I mean by this? Pride fights a two front war of attrition to make you believe that perhaps you've overcome pride, that you are immune to pride, all while planting strong roots in the fruit that you are trying to produce alongside of God until it spoils that fruit and your ability to perceive the value that that fruit actually has. And so let me break down that statement. We just finished saying that there's two forms of pride. One I would argue is less common and more obvious, which is pride in our natural abilities. And the other, which is more common and harder to recognize, is pride in the way that we behave. And so I say pride fights a two-front war because it's consistently trying to get you to fail in either one or both of those situations to fall into one of those traps or both of those traps, but it has a preferred target, and it would be our idea or our belief that its preferred target would be to target people who are preaching, people who are doing worship, something that's public, something that's before people, because we think that that's gonna reach more people. It's our belief or our perception that this is what pride's primary target is, but I believe that pride would prefer to associate itself with pride only existing on the altar or pride only existing under the worship team, right? Pride would have you believe that only a preacher can be arrogant, right? Only somebody who's leading a ministry can be prideful. Only somebody who's got some kind of charge can be prideful because in letting you to believe that, it can fight the front on another side, right? Where pride in your character might go unnoticed, right? Pride in who you are and how you behave might go unnoticed. By making a spectacle of a few individuals here and there on an altar, pride lulls you into a false sense of comfort where you believe, I'm not up there, so I can't be prideful. I don't present a public opinion, so I can't be prideful. I don't go before other individuals, so I can't be prideful. I can't share in God's glory because I'm not working in his glory. I don't have a platform, right, because I'm not singing or talking in front of people, therefore I'm immune to being proud. When in all actuality, as explained earlier, outside of these situations is where pride does the most damage. And I want to start by giving you guys an example. Have you ever heard somebody use the phrase, I'm going to be the bigger person, and you can fill in the blank? You guys ever heard that phrase? Pretty common phrase that people use in argumentation in situations and confrontations when trying to settle something. They say, I'm going to be the bigger person, and I'm going to forgive so-and-so. I'm gonna be the bigger person, I'm gonna walk away from that situation. 
I'm going to be the bigger person, and I'm going to show that person kindness. I'm going to be nice to them, despite the fact that they were mean to me. What's the intent behind a statement like that, right? At plain view, objectively, what they're describing is a good action, right? If I say I'm going to forgive somebody, that's a good thing, right? That's a godly thing. God asks us to forgive people. If I say I'm going to practice self-control, that's one of the most godly virtues there can exist, right? We talked about fruits of the Spirit. If I say I'm going to be kind to somebody who was mean to me, not only am I showing forbearance, I'm also showing kindness. That's two fruit for the price of one, right? And so at face value, it looks like I'm doing something good. It looks like I'm acting in a godly and Christian way. Few people would look a statement like that. Few people look at an action like that and think to themselves, hey, he's doing wrong in doing that, or he's doing something wrong. But what matters is the intent. What is the intent behind a statement like that? Where is the heart of the individual making those statements, doing those actions? He says, I am going to forgive. I am going to walk away. I am going to be kind and withhold anger. Me, it is I, not anyone else, not the person I'm in conflict with, and most certainly not God. And now suddenly that statement doesn't sound as good as it sounded a second ago, right? Because it's no longer about forgiveness. It's about what I'm going to do. I, Chris, am going to forgive. And pride has taken over the entire intent of an otherwise great action, a moment of conflict resolution, and has spoiled it. An action that appears to be good, which appears to display the fruits of the Spirit, actually becomes rotten from the inside out because it's not rooted in God, but in the person who's trying to take credit for God's good work in them. And it's crazy how fast we can forget where forgiveness comes from, how fast we can try to take credit for something God has worked in us. That's pride, and it's the worst kind of pride because no one else can see it, right? No one else can warn you from a third-party perspective you're doing the right thing, you're forgiving somebody, right? And so pride slips into what otherwise would be a godly interaction and ruins its outcome. It was never for you to forgive in the first place. We started by saying this message that all good things come up from above, right? By recognizing that God is holy, that God is great, that all good things originate from Him, right? So it was never within us or you to show self-control. It was always going to be the Holy Spirit interceding and empowering you to do so. But now, because of pride, flesh has taken the glory, and the end result is devoid of any real godliness. I said earlier, right, that the title to this point is Pride Kills an Individual's Perception of Value. So what did I mean by that? When we let pride take root in our heart, we begin to regard ourselves according to our actions. We begin to praise ourselves, pat ourselves on the back, and assign ourselves titles and accolades that belong to God. I am a forgiving individual because I forgave that person. I am a kind individual. It's no longer God is working kindness in me. It becomes I am kind. It's not God is working goodness in me. It becomes I am a good person. This is who I am. Here's the evidence. Look how nice I am to these people. Look how kind I am to others. Look how good I am before other people. That is me who did that. And it's an easy slip up to make, right? Because it's your resources, it's your time, it's you performing the act, right? It's easy to fall into the temptation of saying, that was me who did that, right? I performed the sacrifice. This part's important, I want you to pay attention because once you have become that gift, once you start to regard that gift from God as who you are, you're inadvertently tying up your entire worth to that one title and that one fruit and to that one gift, right? The ability to be kind, the ability to forgive, the ability to be good, whatever good thing it may be, was never yours to begin with. It was given to you by God, but because you allowed pride to take root, you're cut off, right? The Bible we read earlier, Proverbs 16, 5 says, God detests the proud, right? And suddenly your vision of whom God, the vision of who God wanted you to be 
is spaces away from the individual who you think you're supposed to be and the individual who you think you are. Because God views you as an individual with the capacity to exhibit not just one fruit, but all the fruits. When God sees you or he sees me, he sees somebody who can be kind and forgiving and nice and patient and persevering and enduring. He sees somebody who can show, somebody who has the capacity to show joy, peace, forbearance, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But because I begin to self-identify with kindness as being my own trait, my own attribute, not something that God has given me, now kindness is all I have and kindness is all I can see. And kindness is the only measure of godliness that I can recognize and that I know. It's the only measure of who God is or the only measure of godliness because I've cut myself off from the rest of it. And so this brings us to part two, right? I'm gonna tie it back into relationships. Point number two is an individual with a skewed perception of value will treat others with disregard and disdain. How do you think an individual whose value, and I want you to think about this question, is tied up into one virtue, right, or his belief that he is that one virtue interacts with other individuals? And so I'm gonna invite you to go back to our example, right, and it begins by saying, I will be the bigger person, and you can fill in the blanks again, and I will forgive, and I will show kindness, and I will walk away. What are they doing at that start of that statement, right? We already know that it began by them glorifying themselves but what do they do immediately after that, right? I want you to come with me to 2 Corinthians 10, 12, right? The next immediate action is to compare themselves to the other individual on the other side of that action. And so that verse reads, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves to one another, they are without understanding, right? Another version says, without wisdom. If you can't help but celebrate yourself for being kind, do you really think you'll be able to stop yourself from critiquing others for not exhibiting that exact same quality, right, for their lack of kindness? That statement is so indicative of where our heart lies sometimes, right, because that saying, I will be the bigger person, right, so many of us struggle to realize that in glorifying yourself with that statement, you are making those around you smaller, right? For me to be the bigger person, the person at the end of that interaction has to be the smaller person, right? And we forget, and I had this conversation with somebody the other day, that God is the only one who can create worth and value. Anything, as we explained, that is good comes from up above. And see, so he's the only one who can exalt himself and by extension, make those around him greater. God is the only one who can pride himself, who can make himself bigger to the benefit of everybody around them. But we're not like that. We can't do that. So in order for us to identify ourselves as something good, in order for us to self-glorify in our own actions, someone else, someone, usually someone close to us or near us, has to get smaller, right? If I'm the patient one in a relationship, what does that say about the other person? It doesn't mean that I'm the more patient. It implies that they're impatient right? What am I doing in that statement? I'm assigning myself a level of worth by removing it from the other individual, right? What an ugly action to take. By removing God from the equation, we've also removed the source of all good, and so now to find, I must find a new source, so now when you interact with people, when you take God out of that interaction, the only way to glorify yourself is to steal glory from other individuals, right? If I desire to be known as smart, somebody else has to be known as dumb, right? If I want to say I'm the smartest person in the room, I have to make a bold statement about everybody else in the room, right? If I want to glorify myself in a certain sense, I have to make a statement about everybody else and bring them down. If I desire to say that I'm rational, that means somebody else must be behaving irrationally. Do you see where I'm going? A person infected with pride will fail to see that it's God who worked that goodness in them, right? They'll fail to see that it's God who's showing kindness, God who's working grace in them so that they as an individual could bring grace into the interaction, not take credit for that grace, 
not take credit for that action, not take credit for what that just happened, right? You're not any kinder than the people that you interact with. You're not any kinder than the people that you're dealing with. It's God who's giving you a portion of kindness so that you can insert it into that interaction and both parties can be edified and better for it, right? You think because you forgave somebody faster that you're a good person, right? That you're closer to God because it's not you, right? It's never been in you to forgive somebody. And in a certain situation, it might not be you. It might be the other person forgiving you faster. It's not an indication of how good you are or how good that individual is. It's indication of God's willingness to share grace in that situation and use you as an agent to distribute that grace. It's an indication of God inserting himself into our interactions as human beings and allowing one person to show grace so that the relationship can flourish. You take away from that, right, when you try to own that interaction, when you try to say that action was mine, I'm the one who showed kindness, I'm the one who showed grace, not recognizing that all of it originated from God. And so pride is taking what should be a praise for God, for what God is doing, and trying to give it to ourselves. A person operating under pride will constantly seek the praise and the approval of others because their net worth is no longer tied to what God thinks of them, but what they perceive to be their only value, what other people think of them, right? If I pride myself in being kind, I'm gonna constantly seek other people's approval of that opinion, right? my actions become intimately tied with just that one belief of who I am. Your interactions with other people will be marred because you'll never be able to show kindness genuinely without having an alternate interest in proving that you're kind, but you'll also not be able to receive kindness from anybody, right, without feeling threatened about your own value, right? If all you can identify yourself as is a kind individual, if that's all you think you have going for yourself, that's a source of pride for you. If being a forgiving individual is a source of pride for you, what are you going to do when somebody else tries to forgive you first? All you can do is question it, right? What do you do when you encounter an individual who's both forgiving and kind, right? As somebody whose entire personality revolves around this, this pitfall of pride, you have to question them, right? You have to believe you have to bring other people around you down, right? If your entire worth comes from you being kind and other people being unkind, then you can't accept kindness, right? And you can't show sincere kindness. And so in a moment, which was supposed to be an interjection of grace by God to help us, suddenly becomes a pitfall for you in which you're obligated to break down the people around you, to continue to maintain that image of who you are to continue to maintain that image that Chris is a forgiving individual, right? Other people can't forgive Chris. To maintain the appearance that Chris is a kind individual. Other people can't show kindness to Chris because if Chris receives kindness, Chris is no longer unique, right? If, other, if everybody's nice, then I'm no longer unique as nice, right? And if the only thing I believe I have going for myself is being nice, then nobody else can be nice. Right, and so we talked about earlier, right? You have to continually make the people around you smaller for you to be big. And that's exactly what pride is, right? How can I pride myself in being a forgiving individual and then have somebody beat me to the punch, right? What am I gonna think through my mind? I'm gonna think, are they being sincere? I don't think so. Only I can be sincere, my apologies. I got hurt worse than they did. That's why it's so easy for them to apologize, right? Because if I haven't forgiven them yet, there's no way that they can have forgiven me yet, right? Because I'm a forgiving individual. They have an ulterior motive for being nice to me, right? Because if I can't be nice to you for no reason, there's no way you can be nice to me, right? Because I'm the nicest person I know, right? If he, I'm not able to practice self-control around this situation, there's no way he can practice self-control around that situation because I'm the guy who practices the most self-control, right? And so surely in secret, he's doing something wrong, right? And so you become unable to recognize good in individuals and feel a constant need to break down the people around you, people that God is trying to use to feed into you, right? People that God is trying to get you to feed into them. And so you begin to break down relationships and you begin to break down the church and you begin to break down friendships, family. And there's just 
this, this plethora of consequences. And, and I thought of a good example. I was searching through the Bible to see like where I could see this most evidently presented. And I, and I just love that Jesus is always the answer to who's the best example, right? And we look at Jesus as he does ministry. And every time, you know, he does something amazing, and every time he performs a miracle, the first thing he does is he says, I do this, right, in the name of the Father, right? I do this through the Father, right? And it's not because Jesus isn't God, but because Jesus is illustrating us in an example. In every interaction that you have, every good idea, every good thing that you do, remember to always glorify God. Remember to always point back to Jesus. Remember to always give him the credit or the glory unless you want to fall into that pitfall of pride, right? And we have plenty of examples of what that looks like in the Pharisees, right? Who were given a special position, who were given special understanding of scripture, who were given the position of worship. They were given the position of bringing priests to the people of Israel, but rather than use it for something good, rather than recognize that God had given them the ability to become a blank slate for him to paint a canvas of glory, they begin to take that glory for themselves, right? They became the people who were good at reading scripture. They were the ones who were good at interpreting law. They were the ones who came up with the law. They were the ones who did this, did this, and did this. And so what did that manifestation look like? It didn't look like love. It didn't look like God's intent for his people. It didn't look what leadership should look like, right? It looked like somebody sequestering God's glory. And if you read all of what they do, um, they're constantly fighting against Jesus. They're constantly question Jesus as he's doing good things and you see that when you allow pride to take seed the intent of God's purpose is circumvented right and there's a, there's a number of examples when Jesus cures right the man who was lame rather than celebrate that this man now has the ability to walk what do they do they question Jesus why because only God should be able to do that God and them right and so if somebody else is doing it they're no longer special Right? When God cures somebody during the Sabbath, what do they say? Hey, the rules say you can't do that. Why? Because they can't do that. And if they aren't able to do it, right, and somebody else is able to do it, the attention is going to go away from them. Right? When Jesus cast out a demon from a young man who had been possessed for a long period of time, what do they say? They don't say, thank God this young man was alleviated from his demon possession. They don't say, thank God that God is working miracles in this situation. They say, he must be working hand in hand with Satan. That's the only reason he was able to cast out that demon. Right? And so these are living examples of how if you glorify yourself in what God is doing through you and other individuals, when somebody else does it, you are going to be a tripping stone for those individuals. And I want to say that situation is the culmination of that happening, right? Because they're regarded as priests, they're regarded, their responsibility is to testify about what God is doing. And in that situation, rather than interject and say, thank God this young man was saved, thank God this demon was driven out, what did they do? They recognized God before them and testified against him, right? And this is where Jesus talks about, right, the deadliest sin of them all, right? When he talks about, you know, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, because there's these individuals who have been entrusted by God to lead his congregation, entrusted by God to deliver his people, entrusted by God to give a solid message that people can follow, right? To give a kind of leadership that people can emulate. And they're doing the opposite, right? Instead of pointing people back to Jesus, instead of saying, guys, you know, all that we've been doing, all that we've been serving in the Lord has been for this moment. Here is your Messiah. They recognize Jesus, they see him perform a miracle, but their pride and their desire to maintain power causes them to say, that's not God, that's got to be Satan. These are the pitfalls of pride, right? Because pride develops under you, right? It loosens the soil on which you stand, and by the time that you realize that you're no longer on a firm foundation, it's too late. Right, because pride ties your tongue. Pride inhibits you from saying sorry. Pride inhibits you from asking for help. Pride inhibits you from reaching out to other individuals. Pride inhibits you from interacting with others. Right, because by the time that you recognize that you've messed up, you're too proud to turn around and say, hey, wait, this is actually the way it's supposed to be. And so that's what today's message is about, church. I can't stress enough how important it is that we exercise an appropriate amount of caution around this sin. Because as Jonathan Edwards said, it's a sin 
that sneaks in under the guise of humility, right? That pretends to be humble. It's the kind of sin that pretends to be a good action when in reality it's not. It's the kind of sin that spoils the fruit that God has for you without letting you be aware that it's spoiling that fruit. It's the kind of sin that allows you to live an entire life perceivably under the walk of Christ, but walk straight into hell. This is the sin of pride. This is the sin that allows you to do good, but not be good. It's the sin that allows you to produce fruit that seems edible, but isn't edible. And I can't emphasize enough how dangerous it is because everybody always will say, that's not me, right? I don't have a platform. I'm not like that. I don't do that. And that's the biggest mistake you can make because it's so easy to be driven to believe that any action is yours, that any action is something that you did, any circumstance is something that you did. Because ministry takes work, because ministering into people takes time, because walking with God requires sacrifice, because walking with God requires enduring people you don't want to endure, because walking with God requires you to be kind to people you don't want to be kind to. It can be easy to think, I'm doing these things, I'm showing these godly characteristics and take the glory away from God. I invite the worship team to come up and I invite you guys to stand on your feet. I began this message by saying the prescriptive medicine, right, to all things is worshiping the Lord and I continue to feel that way and I hope that you feel the same now and recognizing that the best way to avoid allowing yourself to become the handiwork of the devil, or allowing yourself to become a tool of pride is to take every opportunity that you can to give the glory back to God. Take every instance, every situation, allow every one of your breaths to point back to Jesus and say, God, any good thing that comes from me comes from you. And so I want to invite you, church, as we go into this moment of worship, to recognize the good that God does in us, to credit God with that, right? To think about all the interactions in which you've allowed pride to inhibit, right, healing, inhibit the distribution of the spirit. And we're all guilty of it at times. We're all guilty of standing in the way and the path of the Holy Spirit. But I want to invite you guys. It's not a special kind of altar call. It's the kind of altar call that we should all be doing all the time, and it's just glorify God. As we go into this moment of worship, I want to invite you guys to sincerely say from your heart, God, to you is all the glory. God, to you, right, be all the praise. God, I thank you because if I'm good at reading scripture, it's because you've given me a mind that does that for me. If I was able to forgive this person for this, it's because you gave me the ability to forgive them. God, allow me to see other individuals the way that you see me. Allow me to forgive other people the way that you forgive me. Allow me to be kind to other people the way that you're kind to me. God, allow me to recognize in these interactions, in these situations, as I go and I show the love of Christ to other people, show me continuously that I need to love on them the way that you originally loved me, God. You, you encountered us, God, when we were your enemies, when we were rebels, when we were fighting. And so when we encounter people out in the world like that, that are in the exact same position we were at some point, give us patience, God. Give us understanding, Father. Allow us to see that if we are where we are now, Allow us to see that if we have the understanding that we have now, if we have the freedom to walk in your unforgiveness, if we have the freedom to forgive freely, if we have the freedom to be kind, it's because you gave us that freedom. That didn't come from any of us. None of us were born forgiving. None of us were born kind. None of us were born showing self-control. And so it's important for us as individuals, as we go out and we interact with people who don't know God, people who haven't had the opportunity to encounter the grace and the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives, that we show them the same amount of grace that God showed us. By not being prideful, but by remembering that if you're at any situation now where it's easy to forgive, where it's easy to be kind to people, it's because at some point you weren't. At some point you were jagged and rough around the edges, and with time God smoothed those edges over, and he's doing the same in other individuals, and he's doing the same in people that you might consider less than you, right? And so when you think to yourself, I'm gonna be the bigger person, think about 
at one point you were the smaller person and God lifted you up and he didn't tell you you're tiny for it. He didn't say, look how worthless you are. Look how much better I am than you, right? He loved you. He caressed you. He took care of you. He taught you a lesson with humility and with kindness. If Jesus could do it, if Jesus could walk the earth and help people and teach people without saying, look at me, I'm God. Why can't you be like me? If God can continue to be patient with us, if God can still interact with us, still seek out sinners, still seek out stubborn people and not bring to the forefront how much better he is than them, then why do we feel the need to do that, right? Why do we feel the need to hold back the blessings of God behind this paywall of saying, hey, you can have my kindness, but I need you to recognize that it's me who's doing this, right? God didn't ask you to do that. God didn't stop and say, hey, before, you know, I'm nice to you, you need to let the world know how, how unnice you are, right? God gave it to you freely, so why do we feel like we have some kind of right to hold that back from other individuals? And so I wanted to invite you guys to just, in this moment of worship, just worship God for who he is, thank him and ask him, glorify him, tell him, God, continue to work that miracle in me, God. Continue to allow me to show grace, Father. Allow me to point everybody back to you the way that you first encountered me, God. It's in mercy, it's in a non-prideful approach. God went to the cross for us. He died on that cross. He faced mockers. He faced a crown of thorns. His clothes was torn. He was treated like a criminal. And not once did he stand up and say, I deserve better than this. I am your God. How dare you treat me like this? He took it. He endured it. He removed all pride from himself for the sake of us as individuals. And so let's ask God, let's give the glory to God and allow him to work that in us so that we too can put our pride aside and become appropriate vessels for his glory. Bless us, Father. Bless us with an intimate understanding, God. But when we say all good things come from you, God, let us mean it. Let us be sincere, God, when we speak those words, God. Let every breath that we take, God, every action that we take, God, not be to glorify ourselves, God, but to lift you higher, God. The Bible says, let me become smaller, God. Let me become smaller if it would only mean that you would become bigger. God, I want you to, I pray, God, that you work that within us today, God. Make us meager, God. Make us meek. Make us humble, God, so that you may be exalted, God. Use us, Father, however you see fit, God. Remove any perception that we might have, God, of what we're worthy of, God, of what we deserve, God. Use us, God, as the creator of all things, how you see God, how you see fit, God, and how you desire, God. And so we pray this.